from Barangaroo Studios, the AusBiz COB is the key stuff you need to know about the day in business and finance. Well, hello, this is the COB, all the stuff you need to know about the day in business and markets. I'm Juliette Sarley. Let's have a look at where we are closing up on this Thursday. And it has actually been six sessions of gains on the local market. We're up by about a third of 1% on the SIBO 200 index. And uh, just looking as well at the ASX 200, it is up 15 points, closing just above that 7,100 point level, which market watchers like to see. 7,102.9, in fact, and the all Lords 72.98, so a gain of about uh, two tenths of one percent. We'll get into this a little bit more with Kyle Rodder from Capital in a moment, but it's been really interesting to see the sell off in the healthcare space today. And with that in mind, let's have a look actually at our three themes uh, that we've been following here at AusBiz. It certainly has been this rally on momentum. I spoke about the fact that we are higher for a sixth session in a row. I was talking to James McIntosh earlier from uh, where he was, who was speaking to me on the trade and also uh, from 8cap Zoran Krezovic both kind of indicating maybe we're starting to see the tide turning. I also spoke earlier to the City Australia CEO Mark Woodruff and he was saying look we focus so much on the negatives but there's a lot to be positive about at the moment if we get more clarity from central bankers, you could actually start to see some more momentum coming through into these equity markets as well. Inflation Nation, of course, we are on watch for the US Consumer Price Index for September. That is going to be a key one for the Fed. In terms of the PPI, that business inflation piece, it rose by half of 1% in September, above expectations of a gain of a third of 1%. And the annual growth rate actually lifted 2% to 2.2% in September, again, above estimates of 1.6% and core PPI when you strip out food, energy and trade was up by 0.2 of 1% in September. But of course, the core price index, that CPI, very key for market watchers. And we'll bring you the reaction to that and uh, what we see in reaction to Wall Street during Friday's uh, day on AusBiz. And I mentioned the weakness in the healthcare sector. And look, this is really interesting because you are seeing CSL tanking again, down for another session by 5.5%. We have seen AGL signing a seven-year renewable energy agreement to sell to CSL. But the other narrative is these weight loss drugs because you're seeing the likes of ResMed under significant pressure as well, down 5%. Remember, it is the company behind that sleep apnea therapy. Now, Azempic by Novo Nordisk, we've been following this story for quite some time. Well, overnight on Wall Street, we saw that uh, there was early success of the the Danish rival Novo Nordisk Ozempic trial in a trial to treat kidney failure. So drug maker Eli Lilly, that was gained by four and a half percent. Just continuing that narrative of if we continue to see more and more people take up these weight loss drugs, what then happens to the flow and effect? The likes of ResMed, it's sleep uh, apnea therapy. You even saw Walmart last week saying, you know, they're seeing consumers buy less at the supermarket because they're not as hungry. It's a fascinating narrative, one that we continue to watch. Let's have a look at the healthcare sector in general. As we close out the day's trade, CSL I mentioned is a laggard. Cochlear off by seven tenths of 1%, ResMed down by 5%. We'll take a look as well at some of the other movers in the space. Ramsey Health is up half of 1% and sell down just slightly. And when it comes to REITs, always interest rate sensitive. Stockland, Mervac, GPT and Charter Hall, uh, that REIT all higher today. Uh, the Charter Hall stock specific down 1.5%. Looking at the banks, all the big four closed higher today. Macquarie Group also firmer up 1%, $171.50. So uh, also a bit of a comeback, I think, from from Bank of Queensland after its results uh, earlier in the week. And when it comes to the material space, BHP was up half of 1%. Newcrest Mining was up by 2%. We did actually see weakness on the LME, uh, but the copper futures price was down by about half of 1%. So those miners bucking that downward downward trend. Uh, Coming to the energy market, global oil prices did slip during Wednesday's trade. Fears of these uh, disruption to supplies due to the conflict in the Middle East receding somewhat because you did have Saudi Arabia pledging to help stabilise the market. Uh, Santos closed down by 1.3%. Beach Energy was off by about a third of 1%. 
Let's have a look at as well some of the top corporate stories that we've been following today and Liontown has extended its due diligence period to Albemarle. This is following this fresh takeover offer. Of course, Gina Reinhart also increasing her stake, really making this uh, quite difficult, you would think, for Albemarle for their now $6.6 .6 billion takeover bid. We're watching Newcrest Mining after Newmont shareholders approved that acquisition. Newcrest closing higher by 2%. We've talked the CSL story there, so 5.5% off, $239.81. Uh, Redbubble was also a really interesting one today. Uh, Redbubble closing higher by about 26% today. Um, the story with Redbubble was it has returned to underlying cash flow according to their quarterly trading update. So they booked an underlying cash flow of $700,000. That was up $16.9 million on the prior corresponding period. Uh, I guess an increase of $700,000 in terms of underlying cash. And Air New Zealand was under pressure, although certainly closing off the lows when it was down around 3% earlier. Uh, Air New Zealand cautioning the market against using its first half financial 24 earnings guidance to the full year, given what they say, quote, the ongoing uncertainties in the trading environment. Of course, things very difficult still in the travel industry. Well, the stock of the day was Tabcorp. You know, people, it's a high cost of living environment. People are a lot tighter with their money. But so naturally, these kind of companies come under pressure in such an environment. But at the same time, it is a really strong company. They're executing a really good plan. Um, I would take this as a buy opportunity, to be very honest with you, um, ahead of some busy times for the company. So some revenue strength coming through and yeah, it's an exciting time. So yeah, buy. From a team invest perspective, we never like companies like this because our members have a philosophy that um, you shouldn't invest in anything unless you'd like it to be hugely successful and more of it in the world. So, um, and while the members often have different opinions on different things, it's pretty much uh, unanimous among our membership that nobody really thinks the world benefits by having more gambling. That was the stock of the day. I got ahead of myself as well. I forgot to mention that the reason Tab Corp was our stock of the day was that it re its revenue, excuse me, dropped uh, more than 6% in the first quarter. Gaming servers revenue down 12.7%. And this was due to the sale of eBet and lower contracted electronic gambling machines. Someone who never lets anything get ahead of him is Kyle Rodder from Capital.com. Welcome to the COB. Uh, Kyle, six sessions of gains. I mean, is this a turnaround? It's starting to shape up that way and I think it's just that kind of drop in bond market volatility we've seen over the last week and that was certainly supported last night in the Fed minutes which um, you know very eloquently a lot of people are putting putting it out there that it's moved from a how high to a how long conversation and the market seemed to be fairly comfortable with that I mean we're going into this CPI release tonight which is going to be incredibly crucial about Fed expectations and especially whether the Fed might have another 25 basis points in them before the end of the year. Um, but overall, that kind of, I guess, really painful um, and probably fairly disorganised move in the bond market we saw for um, a couple of months seems to be diminishing a little bit. Obviously, we saw yields generally lower again today, and that supported equity prices um, basically across the board. I got a nice test of 6,800. That seems to be just a, a very strong buying level there, back through 7,000 uh, or 7,100 now. So from a technical standpoint, things are, lo are looking a little bit more constructive. And I think, I mean, if we can continue to get signs that the Fed won't need to hike again, that could be supportive of, of risk assets uh, in the near term and, you know, maybe even catalyze a little bit of movement in the FX markets as well, because we're starting to see some signs of weakness in the, uh, in the US dollar. And Carl, I guess one of the key points as to whether or not the Fed is done is going to be with that inflation data that we're waiting for. Uh, just talk us through how important that is, what you're expecting. Yeah, obviously vital. Um, you know, the next Fed meeting is only three weeks away. It's the 1st of November. So, um, you know, we will get a, a core PC PCE index read before then. But um, as far as the sort of major events go, well, we've got the minutes out of the way now. We've got the job starter out of the way now. Um, so it's going to be this and another PCE read. And the expectations largely is for another moderation in um, core inflation in particular. Um, and it's going to be around, a uh, forecast are expecting around 4.1%. If we get that, it'll be the lowest level that we've seen in about two years. So, I mean, I guess it depends if you're an optimist or, or, or a pessimist. The optimist suggests that it's continuing to come down. It's coming to coming down in a way that seems to be consistent with the Fed's forecasts and where they see, uh, uh, I guess, um, inflation going uh, under 
under what it considers currently as sufficiently restrictive uh, conditions. You know, the flip side of that, though, is obviously it's still twice, not that obviously the, the, the Fed um, targets CPI in particular, but it's still twice the level roughly that, it, that, uh, that the Fed wants core inflation of, of 2% or so. So there's still a lot of work ahead of the central bank. But, I mean, if we do get a, a reasonably, uh, you know, I suppose in line or, or lower than expected number tonight, I mean, that could really be a, a catalyst for risk assets, especially those interest rate areas of the market quite naturally too. I mean, if we do see a shock to the upside, we did see PPI obviously last night coming a little hotter than expected and then clearly um, well that uh, that narrative of another hike before the end of the year from the Fed is back on the table um, and uh, I suppose it'll be interesting and end to the week but it'll certainly be crucial especially when you consider you know we've also got jobless claims data out tonight uh, as well as an ECB meeting which again for, for traders is, is you know sort of worth watching on the basis that it could um, you know be a fairly significant driver of, of some of the short-term trends that we're seeing in price action at the moment. Uh, let's talk about the FX markets and whether or not there's an inflection point there too because the dollar, the greenback, has been a little weaker. But I know that you're also watching the Aussie against the Kiwi as we head into the New Zealand election. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. And I, th I think um, one that, you know, probably just because we're not as much of a media centre as the rest of the world, and of course New Zealand uh, is, is even uh, smaller as a, as a media centre than that, is that we don't talk about it quite as much. But you do see the markets moving ahead of these sorts of events. And it is going to be fairly significant. I mean, I'm certainly no analyst when it comes to Kiwi politics, so I won't try and get too yeah. too deep into that. But there is a sense, of course, that the Nationals will will win power, will, be, uh, will do so for the first time in several terms. And interestingly enough as well, um, one policy that the Nationals have run on is effectively changing the RBNZ's mandate to exclude employment, which would make it uh, far more focused on price stability, which would arguably be, um, you know, an upward, uh, put some upward pressure on the on the Kiwi dollar because, of course, all of a sudden uh, inflation is the uh, is the name of the game and, you know, the only game in town, so to speak. But we are seeing some uh, weakness going uh, uh, in the Kiwi going into that particular event, obviously probably a little bit of risk off there. Uh, there's also, too, on top of that, just the kind of shift in uh, story that we've had in terms of uh, New Zealand fundamentals recently. And, you know, a fairly clear hint, I think you could, you could say from the RBNZ a couple of weeks ago when it met that it probably thinks that rate hikes are done with. Uh, and interestingly enough, we're still seeing, um, we'll call it sort of 20, 25 basis points of hikes, depending on uh, what uh, what instrument you like to use, being baked in to the market for future RBNZ policy. So in principle, if the markets have diverged there quite significantly in terms of what the RBNZ is, is guiding for, well, you know, potentially we're seeing a little bit of a turnaround in the Kiwi, in particular the Aussie Kiwi, which we call Aussie Kiwi, which is starting to, to benefit from, or well, the Aussie against the Kiwi is starting to benefit from the shift in the China narrative as well, which Aussie tends to be a little bit um, a, a better play on China than, than New Zealand is on a, on a relative basis. So mm. one definitely cool. to watch. And again, um, if you're a wonk and, and enjoy the kind of, um, you know, kind of battle of ideas when it comes to what how a central bank will run, this, this election might have implications for that. Uh, just a final quick question about the crude oil market. I mean, it's so difficult to talk amidst the humanita humanitarian crisis that we are seeing at the moment, but it does seem like Saudi Arabia coming in saying they will look to stabilise the market has given traders a bit of reprieve. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it gives us obviously that sort of buffet um, there that, you know, effectively we can see supply increased if necessary. Um, that's uh, obviously very, very good news, I think. What we're sort of looking for now is obviously any sign of escalation and particularly around, around some of those very uh, important flashpoints in the region. You know, we haven't got a great sense yet of Iran's involvement and understanding of the attack from Hamas prior to the event. There's also obviously conflicts breaking out on the um, on Israel's northern border uh, with Hezbollah, which could also potentially uh, implicate uh, international powers as well, or at least destabilise the, the region a little bit and um, you know bring further uncertainty um, around obviously the geopolitical situation there that could involve either sanctions um, or obviously um, further trade barriers, particularly on a, on Iran, which is on. Um, like I said, you know, um, it's still sort of to be determined the, the kind of level of influence that Iran has had in this situation and their knowledge of, of the attack prior to it. So the fact the Saudis are stepping in here is obviously um, a, a reasonably positive thing. It also indicates, too, that I mean, there's that argument that uh, part of the reason the ha uh, Hamas uh, attacked uh, how it did and when it did was to try and destabilise these talks between Israel, Saudi Arabia and the United States. If there is still that uh, multilateral conversation going on, that's also good for the region uh, and also good for oil prices. Uh, but again, we'll just keep an eye on obviously those those flashpoints, especially considering, of course, Israel is obviously, well, reportedly uh, putting uh, troops along the border. And we don't know if there's going to be a ground assault there yet. We'll have to keep an eye on, on all those moving parts. Um, but, but for the time being, um, there seems to be less concern that this is going to evolve into a major supply disruption in the oil market. 
All right, Kyle Rotter from Capital.com. We thank you as always for your insights. Thank you. All right, let's have a look at uh, some of the leaders and laggards in the session. Core Lithium up 7.4%. That's quite an interesting pop on the close there. Of course, Lithium very hot right now. Brainship Holdings also looking really good. Up 5.8% on the close to 18 cents. Star Entertainment, uh, it rose by 6%. I'm not sure whether there was too much move behind that uh, gain, but I will try and find out for you. And uh, we saw Nickel Industries up 5.3%, Siona Mining up 4.4%. Of course, that's a very liquid stock that moves uh, quite a lot given its small cap nature. Uh, excuse me, back on Star Entertainment, I am seeing a story from the AFR in terms of its capital raise. Remember that it had uh, that second tap to the market and the AFR, Miriam Robin, has written an interesting story about uh, at next month's AGM, the owners are going to really be asked to approve some of these retention linked performance rights for the new CEO they were meant to be worth about 90% of his fixed pay but of course we have seen uh, these capital raisings pushing the share price down and it's about 36.2% below the figure at which his retention rights were calculated so this is quite interesting in terms of that overall move but you know today we did see Star Entertainment rise by about six percent and interesting as well seeing some of those moves uh, in terms of the miners okay we're looking now at the laggards and tabcorp of course was one that was in focus it has fallen down by 6.4 percent to 92 cents and this after it announced its revenue dropped 6.1 percent in the fiscal quarter of the financial year 24. gaming services revenue was down 12.7 percent due to the sale of ebet and lower contracted electronic gambling machines csl we've talked about i mean there's a couple of stories here the agl uh, move and that has certainly had an impact with agl signing a seven year renewable energy agreement to sell to see CSL, the biotech company, but also being weighed down and ResMed as well by this narrative that if more people are taking these weight loss drugs that seem to be having a very positive effect on a number of things, Eli Lilly's latest uh, drug, the, the rival to Ozempic, has uh, been successful in its trial to treat kidney failure, then maybe you wouldn't be using the likes of ResMed's sleep apnea therapy. Fisher & Paykel also down by 4%. Uh, it closed at $19.8. Reliance Worldwide uh, was down by about 4% to $3.74. All right, let's have a look at the small caps leaders and laggards as well. Redbubble up 25.8%, uh, Zip up 9% and taking a look at the laggards as well. Highfield Reds down 11.4%, Eris Resources off 6.5%. Taking a look at what is happening overnight, well, we've been talking about the key inflation data coming through from the US. Of course, also the weekly jobless claims. Both of these will feed through into what we see from the Fed at their next meeting, which, as Carl told us, is just a couple of weeks away. UK GDP also for a read on uh, how the overall UK economy is going. And just getting back to that Fed story, you've got a speech as well coming through from the Boston Fed President Collins. Let's take a look as well at what we've got on the docket for tomorrow. China CPI and PPI for September and China's trade balance. There was a bit of uh, projection of stimulus from Chinese authorities, which also helped the overall market mood today. Eurozone industrial production for August, the US Michigan consumer sentiment uh, October initial read, and a number of AGMs and companies paying out their dividends as well. We've got uh, a few of those, including Harvey Norman, which uh, paid out a 12 cent dividend franked at 100%. All right, let's have a quick look at the market action as we head into, well, we've closed out the day now, up by a third of 1%, six sessions of gains coming through. And when it comes to the overall ASX 200, it has gained a quarter of 1% to 7,105. It's up 2.6% over the past five days. Well, that is it from us, but we will, of course, be back tomorrow with all the reaction to that inflation data that we will get out on the US overnight and how that's moved global equity markets. As always, you can keep up to date with all our interviews at osbiz.com.au online there, of course, and we had some great conversations today from the City Investor Conference here in Sydney. See you tomorrow.